Yes, Yay. what is up, everybody? Happy Monday. Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 160. A nice, even number. Getting up there. Yeah, getting up there. I think I've been saying that for weeks now. I, we'll, we'll say it every week, <laughs> because every week we'll, we'll getting be getting up, up there. there. Uh, tonight's show, uh, I am so excited, because we get to kind of relive an experience that even as for crew and as uh, not a pacer, but crew and spectator was overwhelming and exhausting. But we get to actually recap what happened at the Barkley Marathons with the only finisher and winner, Mr. John Kelly. And I'm really yes. excited to have him on the show tonight. Uh, he might be delirious. I don't know. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's totally back together uh, because it's been only a week. But the Barkley is one of those things that I, I can't, I've never done it, but I can only imagine rips you to shreds both mentally and physically so we're going to talk all about it on tonight's episode of ginger Runner live episode number 160 happy monday everyone sit back relax grab your beverage of adult or not adult choice and get ready here we go <laughs> ginger runner yay <laughs> Happy Monday, everybody. Happy Ginger Runner Live episode number 160. Uh, I think you would do a little bit better. <laughs> I, I, I have to be honest. This this actually went on much faster than I thought. No wonder our guest tonight used one as his means of rain protection. I think I tried to make mine too fancy. Yeah, yeah. I tried to like, I was like, I'm going to tie what it in the front this? in a little bow. <laughs> what is that? It's a shawl? It is. A, oh, oh, there. That's oh, much see? better. Your, your, yeah, your shoulders fit right into the uh, corner pockets. Uh, not brought to you by Target. Not yeah, we're not sponsored. <laughs> not sponsored. Okay. Ripping it off. All right. Uh, all kidding aside, our guest tonight is a monster. He's he's incredible, a badass. This guy deserves all the credit you can throw at him and more, uh, because he was the only finisher of the 2017 Barkley Marathons. And we're going to talk to our guest tonight all about. Uh, how many years it took to for him to actually finish, all the amount of training that went into it, his history with the race, mm -hmm. his history at the park. I'm I'm so excited to to introduce our guest tonight, the one and only single finisher of the 2017 Barkley Marathons, Mr. John Kelly. What's up, John? Yay. Yay. Not much. How are y'all doing? <laughs> Glad to be We're here. good. Yeah. Uh, just so people aren't like, what the hell was going on at the top of the show? There's a, a few people going. What, what? the hell? We'll get to it, I'm sure, in more detail throughout the course of this show. But, John, why are the uh, the grocery bags so important here? Uh, just to kind of clarify for people briefly. So, you know, the lap five this year, we uh, we got some pretty cold rain. I didn't have rain gear or enough warm gear with me. And, and going up rat jow with the wind especially, uh, it, it got pretty pretty cold. And, uh, you know, there's there's some trash there kind of strewn through the briars and I was kind of opportunistically looking at things that might help me out. And I, I saw, saw a grocery bag there and uh, thought it might make a suitable poncho. So I got that on and it, the briars kind of made quick work of it. Uh, but <laughs> I, I did have that on for the rest of the race there for some minimal amount of, of rain protection. I was just shocked to see that you had it on at the, at the finish. At the finish. But it was like, at that point, it had turned into a string bikini. I mean, it was shredded. I, it, it, you're right. Yeah, the briars yeah. tore it apart. And at some point, you just kind of forget that it's on. It's right. <laughs> uh, so, Randy Cafaro in the chat room makes a good point for us, Ethan. What's that? Randy says, don't wear that in the woods during hunting season. The big targets. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's a that's a valid point. Thank you very much, Randy. Uh, we will not, mine's already shredded, but we will not be wearing those in the woods. That's that's a valid point. So tonight's show, uh, we're going to have to cover a lot of topics because we, we are um, a bit slow on time, or not slow on time, but behind time and short on time with, with John. So I want to make sure that we utilize as much of this as possible. Uh, John, if you could summarize basically what the Barkley is for those who maybe are not familiar. I know that's a lot to do in a short amount of time, but maybe your history with this race and what drew you to this race? What makes it special for you? So I, the general thing that I think draws most people to Barkley is it's just an, an opportunity to really find your limits, to identify where they are, and then to try to keep pushing them farther out. And, you know, everyone that's kind of been successful at Barkley has had that internal motivation to do that. 
you know, with the kind of explosion in popularity, I think that you, you're going to see people wanting to do it for uh, other forms of motivation. But but for me, it was that initial piece. And then on top of that, it, it is, it's it's right across the street from where I grew up, the uh, chimney top, the, the mountain that the final page is on, you know, that's, that's what looks over our family's farm. And it was just, uh, you know, I, I wanted to go out there and I wanted to have that experience in the mountains that were home to me. And uh, I wanted to kind of do it for the home crowd as well. And, and uh, you know, win one for the, the local community there and, and defend our own mountains. Now you, I mean, you grew up camping and hiking on these trails. Did you ever think growing up that you would participate in an event in, in this park on these trails, a, a, an event like this? No, definitely not. So, I mean, we kind of knew what Barkley was when I was growing up. Uh, you know, these crazy people came down uh, once a year and ran through Frozen Head. But it's it's a small rural community and there's there's not much of a running scene. Right. Uh, so it wasn't until high school when I, I started running cross country and track that I really looked more into this event and, and learned more about it. And I, I thought, well, yeah, one day that that'd be cool to do. But it was it was kind of a pipe dream. And, you know, one of those thoughts that just, you know, that's cool, but probably will never happen. I think that's fascinating to know that you grew up in this park and you knew of this event that happened in the park. I mean, the, did the locals talk about the Barkley marathons? It's like, oh, there's there's these crazy people out in the woods that do this weird thing. Or was it something that kind of uh, uh, tickled your fancy a little bit and something that you were really curious about? Yeah. So again, it was it was more curiosity than anything. Uh, so we knew about it. We didn't really talk about it. And that is one of the, the really cool things that I've gotten to see as I've, I've done this race over the past three years is, is seeing the increased level of, of community interest and involvement and, and pride uh, in this event that, you know, takes place in their tiny little corner of the world and, and attracts people from, from everywhere. I, I mean, we've had very little... We were there last year and we were there this year documenting Gary Robbins's run, of course. Uh, we would be remiss not to mention any of that. We will probably a little bit later in the show, especially since John spent many, many hours with mm -hmm. Gary out there uh, learning a lot about each other. Um, it's just, it's so interesting to, Kim and I are new to that area, to Wartburg, Tennessee, to really any of Tennessee. And it was really interesting to see the locals come around this event. Uh, everyone in town knows it's happening. Everyone kind of uh, we got recognized from the local <laughs> restauranteurs that were there like, hey, we remember you guys from last year. You guys want the same food? We're like, how do you know our orders from a year ago? I mean, also like the best people I best think, on this planet people. that we've ever met. <laughs> and it's, it's really, really special. As someone who's participated within this event for multiple years, but also had a history knowing of it and growing, growing up in the area, do you like this increased attention on it? I mean, we're as guilty as anybody, any news organization, since we are having a podcast about it and there's going to be a movie. Uh, do you like this newfound attention? Um, do you think it's helpful for the event or, or do you just wish to have that unique individual experience uh, just as John Kelly and not as, you know, with all the media attention and stuff like that? Yeah, so it's it's definitely a, a fine balancing act between those two. And Laz has done a great job of it, kind of uh, allowing some exposure, but somewhat limiting it. And and having some amount of it is, is very important to kind of keep the race going, keep it a, a priority at, at the park and, and allow us the access to to do the off trail running this this one weekend a year. And for me, you know, again, I. I initially did this for internal reasons, and there's a part of me that wishes I had finished pre-documentary, and I could just kind of take my finish and go home and hide. Um, but at, at the same time, it's it's been incredible for me to see this uh, outpouring of support and how it's been able to to motivate and, and inspire others. So I, I think that you know you need a little of both, and I think that as long as we can continue with uh, kind of limiting the the in-person spectators, you know, to where we don't have the, the park and the campground kind of overrun. 
I, I, I think it's, it's good for the race and it's good for the uh, kind of ultra running community as a whole. Yeah, that's, that's good perspective. And I want to remind everyone who's watching live that uh, Kim is in the chat room. Yeah, so as always, you guys, I will be in the chat room pulling questions for our guest, and it is a very busy chat room tonight. Oh, yeah. So uh, if, if for some reason we don't get to your question, we're, we're going to do our very best uh, to get to them all. And I do want to give a shout out. Guillaume is in the chat room from France. Guillaume, who, who we got a, got a chance to meet uh, in camp, was also participating in the event this year. Uh, shout out to him. I, be uh, I believe his YouTube channel is Run Explorer, and he's got some footage and stuff like that that, that he managed to get in camp and, and stuff like that. So shout out to Guillaume, who's actually running. And I think he got two two loops or two and a half loops yeah, or something I done. Think so. I it was remember. it was awesome. It was awesome to see him. And he was constantly <laughs> positive the entire week, which was really, really neat. Uh, so yes, Kim will be pulling aside questions throughout tonight's live show. And if we don't get to him, we apologize. We do have a post show with Patreon supporters where we'll be rapid firing through questions uh, as quick as they can come in. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there were a lot of uh, great races that happened this past weekend. And I need to interrupt the show very quickly to give Caitlin Gerben, who is in the chat room, a big congratulations on hey. the golden ticket this weekend. Congratulations on the golden ticket, Caitlin. Nice work. Uh, absolutely crushed the Gorge 100K, which is I'll fantastic. Yes, that's so it's it's quite <laughs> all right. But this is a great uh, chance to now talk to John a little bit about um, his multiple attempts at this race. So, John, set this up. You, this isn't your first time. Um, you've actually attempted it three times. What how, what was the first one like? Because that was your first ultra, which is bonkers, man. That's bonkers. Yeah, so I mean, I, I had a pretty big background in uh, doing multi-day kind of trail runs on my own, doing through hikes, and, and a lot of the guys that have had success in the past at Barkley, that's actually their background. You look at guys like Brett Mounty, uh, Andrew Thompson, uh, that's that's kind of what they did. They came to it from this this backpacking background, hmm. and. But yeah, I, I was very unexperienced that first year and I, I came into it. My biggest issue is is I thought that, you know, I was just going to live off of uh, energy bars and gels for the entire race. And after 30 hours of that, your stomach says, nope, uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not having any more of that. And so I, I got out there and I was running with Jamil Curry and, and we were doing pretty well. And then on that third loop, I just, I... I don't think I ate hardly anything on that third loop. And by the time I got back to camp, uh, I, I was just, I was in awful shape. And I was eligible for uh, going out on the fourth loop. I, I didn't do that. And you know, that maybe the biggest factor really, uh, not only for me being my first ultra, but it was kind of my family's first ultra experience. And so I, I came in looking like I did and, and all the, you know, the experienced Barkley and the experienced ultra people there, you know, ah, get him some chicken soup and, and he'll be fine. <laughs> and meanwhile, my, my family's there and, you know, especially these, these, you know, they've never been exposed to, to any sort of an endurance running. And they're saying, well, should we call an ambulance? Get him to the ER. What's going on? Uh, and so, you know, it, it was a very, eye-opening experience for uh, me and for uh, my, my whole crew, but I'm definitely glad that I was able to get there and, and get that fun run in uh, and, and put in a good showing. And I, I learned a lot from it and obviously progressed from there. Were you at all caught off guard by the difficulty or, or was it different than you expected in that first attempt? So I think that was actually an advantage for me because I didn't have a lot of preconceived notions of difficulty, whereas a, a lot of people come in and they've done all these trail races and they kind of have this standard of, of here's what difficult is. You know, they look at something like hard rock and it's like, oh, that's as hard as it can possibly be. And then they get out there and, and they're shocked. And I, I didn't have that, you know, I, I knew the mountains, I knew the terrain, I knew the obstacles we would have to go through uh, and, and so that that part didn't really surprise me and you know the the tough parts the the mountain laurel thickets the briar patches uh, i think some people go out there and they, they say oh we we have to go through that how do we get through that and you know for me that's that's what i i crawled through as a kid to flush grouse out for my dad and i just say like, okay well that's that's where we go come on uh, wow i mean yeah was there uh, 
growing up with this park, Frozen Head State Park, knowing the trails and this event taking place, I'm, I'm again, I'm guessing a majority off trail. Was that a surprise to you? Were there parts of this park that you're like, I would never have thought to traverse this area? Or did you grow up scouring every nook and cranny? Because that's just what you did as a kid. Yeah. So, you know, you're you're not supposed to go off trail in the park. Uh, that's been around for a while. Uh, we used to kind of go up the south face of chimney top quite a bit when I was a kid. But really, we didn't spend a ton of time in the park. We Most of my mm. time exploring the mountains was off trail. And it was outside the park because that's, uh, I mean, frankly, that's, that's where we could go hunting uh, was was kind of the main reason behind that. So I, I did have the off trail experience and learning how to kind of follow the lay of the land and the features, but I, I wasn't as familiar with the park itself as you Got might it. think. Got it. So you brought up having the preconceived notion of what the event is, what the course is, what the loops are like. And, and I want to make sure that I preface all of this conversation that we're going to talk about tonight, because there might be some, you know, we're going to mention loops and we're going to mention all these things about Barkley. If you were unfamiliar with what the Barkley Marathons is, John mentioned it earlier, but there is a great documentary. Everyone talks about the documentary because it's very well made. Uh, it is available for free on Netflix if you subscribe to that service or online. And it's highly worth watching if you have not watched it already or you are unfamiliar with the event itself. It will right. explain and answer everything that we could potentially talk about tonight. Um, so get that out of the way without having to go into too much history of, you know, explain this, explain that, because right. that would just waste a lot of time. Uh, so no, having you mentioned having that preconceived notion of what the event is now. So your second time, you're coming back to Barkley. Was it for the reason of unfinished business and you wanted to see if you could actually get it done or if you, were you shooting for a fun run? Or was it kind of that ultra mindset of forgetfulness where you forget the pain and the suffering and you just wanted to go back for fun? What, which was it for you? So it's really kind of the same thing that led me to Barkley to begin with where, you know, I, I started running, I got back into running and started doing longer and longer events. And I kept saying, I, I, I can do better. I can, I can go a little bit longer. I, I can go a little bit faster. And so after that first showing at Barkley, I kind of had that same reaction where after a few weeks, I looked back at it and said, I, you know, I, I can do better. I, I wanted to get a good measuring stick of, of what my limits are. And I don't think that was quite my limits. I need to get a nutrition strategy and go back and, and see what I can do. Interesting. So you, you were able to identify the mistakes. I, I don't want to necessarily say they're mistakes. It's your first ultra. I think everyone makes mistakes, but you're able to like find things where you could improve that would better your chances essentially. Right. Was it a pot? Like this is, this is the first time that we met you and saw you um, was the second, second attempt. Yeah. And I, I'm just going to say outright, John, this was, this was the craziest thing we had ever seen in ultra running. Well, up to this year, but watching you come in after your fourth loop was terrifying. You described what your family was going through the year before, and it was <laughs> the same for us. You walking into that gate, dragging your poles, you know, with a thousand yard stare was, was, in, was insane. And you had these incredible uh, barkers come around you as soon as you crossed over the, the yellow gate. They swarmed you, they took your clothes off, they changed everything, they slathered you with and sunscreen, kinda... <laughs> and they just picked you up and like let you start the fifth loop. So that's what we saw. Uh, for you, was it a different experience overall? Uh, do you remember much of it? Um, and do you look back and, and think of that race as a success? Yeah, so it was a, a very different experience for me, primarily because I, I was on my own the entire time. So the, the first year, you know, I was following uh, Bev and, and Alan Abs the first loop, and then Jamil Curry, the second two loops. And that second year, you know, my, my plan was to stick with Jared. And going down the descent to book two, I, I took a briar to the neck. It just closed lined me and ripped me down. And by the time I kind of came to, I, the group was gone. I, I was by myself uh, and, and kind of lost quite a bit of time there. And so for the, almost the entirety of those four loops, I was by myself. I was doing it solo. I was navigating myself. Uh, and it was just a, an incredibly different experience. 
And so on that one, what you kind of saw there and what in, eventually ended up doing me in was, was the sleep deprivation. So year one, it was nutrition. Uh, year two, it was, it was sleep. Damn. Uh, I, I totally forgot that you were out there essentially alone. Was was the navigation easier for you the second year? I mean, were there things that you were familiar with? Because I know it gets harder every year, so LAS does end up changing things. But was that something that you were able to, to knock out pretty well on your own? Uh, so, I mean, it, uh, it was definitely doable with <clears throat> my experience from the first year, but I did make my fair share of mistakes, and mm -hmm. it was those mistakes that caused me to come in from that fourth loop with only 13 minutes to spare and without having a chance to get a nap at any point during the race. And so that was, again, something that once the race was over, I looked at and said, you know, I, I, I can fix that and I can do better. And I, I can come back here and, and take another shot at this. And, and I, I think I can finish it. That's amazing, man, because I know how much this race can take out of a person to both hours and sleep deprivation wise, but nutrition and mental and training and all that. So to even to, you know, to come back a third year is, is, is pretty amazing. We have tons of live questions. So I want to make sure that we get to those because I could just keep talking and talking and talking. Kim, what do we got? Uh, yeah. Question from Kim in the chat room, not myself, different Kim in the chat room. Kim John, uh, what was the hardest aspect of Barkley for you? So this year, the, the two hardest were the fog on loop one which that was just utter chaos. I mean, it was so dense and, you know, we get out there and we're expecting this strong group to be together for the first loop. We had so many top end elite runners in the race this year. Uh, we thought there'd be, you know, eight of us coming in that first loop together. And we get out there in the fog and, and people are relying on me for navigation because I have that experience. And we just, in our over excitement at the beginning of the race, we get, we get lost. We we make mistakes. I feel horrible about those mistakes, and uh, it it was rough. We put ourselves in a big hole. Uh, and then the the other part was the fifth loop, just dealing with the sleep deprivation, just the constant mental and psychological battle to not only stay awake, but to remember why I was staying awake, to not kind of lose my my mind and it, forget that I'm at Barkley and and what I need to do. Hmm. We can get to a little bit more in depth with that in, in a little bit, because I definitely want to talk about the sleep deprivation on this year, uh, this year's fifth loop and stuff. Yeah, there's been not, lots of nap questions. Lots of nap questions. <laughs> and I know that you, you have some incredible quotes that are out there based off of uh, your race experience this year. But um, let's do uh, at least one more question yeah, from the chat question room. question from Joel in the chat room. As a father of young kids, what advice do you have for parents training for long endurance events? Great question. So it, it's really been a huge uh, journey for me and my wife to to kind of increase our efficiency and and how I train. And the the important thing is to to have an open dialogue about it to make sure that things are clear. My wife knows when I'm going to be training and what I'm going to be doing, so that she can kind of know when she'll need to take care of the kids, when I'll be able to take care of the kids, and to really just you know, multitask as much as possible. I find great value in, in doing run commutes, hmm. uh, knock things out early in the morning before the kids get up. And, and then most importantly, just the time that you do have with the kids, make it in, intentional and deliberate and, and make that an, an awesome time together because it's so easy to take time and just, you know, time together is sitting in the living room with the TV on uh, versus, you know, actively engaging uh, with them and, and making the best of, of that time that you do have outside of training. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's always great when we have guests on that do have families. And we got a chance to meet your wife very briefly after the race. And, and we I have, think more of your extended family as well. Uh, yeah, the whole group of them. Yeah. And we have to make sure that we mention this, John, that they are awesome. They, they could see that our camp was fairly emotionally uh, distraught because obviously it was a really really rough finish but we had all this extra gear camping gear that we had bought specifically for the weekend uh and we knew that we would be donating it but they 
were gracious and we're like, we'll take care of everything. And next year we will provide everything. Like your family <laughs> if was you like, you guys need anything? Just let us let know. Let us know. We'll give you 10 sleep. I mean, it was awesome, man. So please thank, thank your whole family. Call every one of them and thank them from <laughs> Ethan and Kim. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> uh, let's get one more question and then I'm going to start diving into this year's race. Sure. Uh, there's a couple of people talking about whether or not you actually train for Barkley on a treadmill. So one, is that true that you did a lot of your Barkley training on a treadmill? So let's actually talk a little bit about training for for Barkley. Yeah. Was there anything that you did specifically for this event that uh, you feel helped? And did you train on a treadmill? Yeah. So uh, that's one of the things I did this year that I haven't done in the past. And that was, again, due to the you know arrival of twins in our family. Uh, my, my typical schedule is I, I do my run commutes during the week. And again, that's just making, uh, being as, as time efficient as I can on my training. And then for Barkley, I, I really focus on getting the elevation gain in during the weekends. Mm -hmm. And so in previous years, I've gone to short, steep hills that are, are near my house. I'm not in the mountains. I don't have the luxury of that. Uh, but I found some, some short, steep hills that I can do very long sets of repeats on. And in previous years, that's what I relied on. But this year, one of those days on the weekend, I would sit the treadmill at 20% and, and go at it. Uh, and that way, I could be there while the kids were napping or while they were playing in the room next to me. And that would give my wife a, a break uh, to, to nap herself or to go do whatever she might need to do. And yeah, I, I hate, I hate the treadmill. Um, and you, you lose out on getting the descent and getting the footing from the, the rough terrain, which I, right. I both think are important, but I, I, I did catch up on, on a lot of TV and, and Netflix, which uh, otherwise I, I never see that at all. So, you know, that was cool. And <laughs> <laughs> cool show. We haven't started that yet. No spoilers. Uh, what I think is fascinating is, is, the amount of varying things, just talking to some people who have who have attempted Barkley, but the amount of varying aspects of this that you have to train for, because there are so many unknowns. Uh, obviously, there are no GPS tracking devices, so you don't really know the distance. There's no real indication of what the elevation gain is, even though I think Laz tells you, but who knows if that's right or if it's a joke. Uh, you don't know where you know the books are. I and mean, there's so many unknowns, including the start time. Is there anything that you can recommend to anyone, uh, like how to prepare for this? Is it is it mental in this case? Is it physical? I mean, is there only so much you can do one way or the other? Yeah. So there there are a ton of variables, and there there are essentially those you can control, and those you can't. I try not to waste too much energy uh, on the second set, except you do kind of have to have a plan in place uh, to know how you'll react to each one. So what you said about so many skill sets being needed is, is dead on. And I think it's one of the beauties of the race in that you can't rely on a single skill. If you're extremely fast, then you don't have to be quite as good at navigation or at fighting sleep deprivation, but uh, you, you can't rely on that and, and finish just from that one thing. Uh, so it's, uh, definitely kind of the sum of all these skills and the ones that you can really work on are uh, your physical fitness in particular your your climbing ability and your descent ability is equally important I feel like my first two years uh, my descending muscles gave out before my climbing muscles did hmm. and then navigation uh, is definitely key just being able to to do basic map and compass and follow features and and kind of delay the lane. And then the final thing I think that you can sort of practice is just dealing with disaster. Uh, kind of get yourself lost, do something that you know you're going to fail at and and see how you react, see how you try to overcome that uh, and, and be able to build that mental strength uh, to fight through the mistakes that are, are, are going to happen. Uh, you, no one is going to have a mistake free Barkley and, and it's right. kind of how you react to it. That's the most important part. You know, we've had other guests on the show that have talked about their experiences at the Barkley marathons and, and it's often brought up that 
if they are successful in, in completing two, three, four loops, even getting out under the fifth loop, many of them contribute that to working with someone who has either finished Barkley before, whether it's like Jared Campbell or, you know, another a previous finisher or, or, or something like that. Did you feel uh, you worked with people your first year, you worked uh, together with some people on your second year this year, um, you and Gary had both been very experienced, uh, at least with last year's race. Did you feel that was beneficial to both of you? Did you guys work together or was it a, an, a unique individual sort of event? You just happened to be in the same sort of time. No, we, we very much worked together, and, and I feel we worked quite well together. And kind of coming out of that fog on, after, uh, on loop one and approaching the end of loop one, we, we looked at each other and we said, yeah, we, we need to stick together. Uh, we were moving at a solid pace, uh, and as long as you're, you're roughly comparable in pace, then just having that second set of eyes for navigation is is enormous because I, I don't care how well you know the course i don't care how good you are at navigation over the course of 60 hours and fighting mental fatigue and everything else you, you're gonna have a mental lapse and having a second person there the probability that you both have that mental lapse at the same time drops drastically and so kind of the, the idea is, you know, you have that and you start wandering off down the wrong spur, going down the wrong direction on a descent. And the second guy can say, well, where are you going, man? <laughs> Get back here. And, and we did that quite a bit where uh, I messed up and he corrected me and he messed up and I corrected him. And we, we also complimented each other quite well, where he was a, a very technical by the book navigator, where he would constantly be looking at his map, taking a bearing. And I'm, I'm more instinctive going by the land, you know, being able to recognize this spur is going to go down and hit this creek and we can use that as a backstop and uh, kind of being able to, to follow the terrain that way. So that, that yeah. worked very well together and was, uh, I think, quite important for both of our success. How about the weather this year? Uh, you had everything. I mean, you literally had everything. Rain, wind, fog, snow, supposedly, sun, heat. Uh, did that play a part in how each loop unfolded for you this year, as well as the new kind of wrench that last threw in where it's washing machine style as opposed to double washing machine style? I mean, did those two things play into either success or potential failure for you guys? Yeah, so weather was a, a huge factor this year. And, and in a way, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I, I got my finish on a, a hard year or at least a, a year that had Barkley weather. The past couple of years, the weather has been uh, fairly nice. It's been cold at times, but we haven't had the fog or the bad rain or the bad heat. And this, this year we had everything. We had that fog on loop one. We had pretty rough heat. Uh, I think it got into the 80s on loop four. Yeah. And then loop five, uh, we, we had the rain and the cold and the fog returned. And I think Gary said he even had some hail and snow uh, up there. So that was a, the fog itself was a huge factor because that set us so far behind. That, that took like an hour and a half of our cushion at, at the start. And, you know, depending on how fast you are, you kind of start with this cushion that you're allowed to have for navigational mistakes. And that fog put us at the point where we, we were kind of up against the wall the entire race. We were fighting for survival and could not afford any more mistakes. And so that, that really changes uh, the picture and, and kind of changes your, your strategy and, and the whole race moving forward. And again, if anything, that's why we looked at each other and said, we've, we've got to work together on this. We uh, are still getting lots of questions from the live room. Uh, before we get to a couple of these, I, I wanted to ask kind of uh, along those same lines as far as strategy, because were you able to come into this race with any sort of strategy? You had done it two years previous. You knew the mistakes, uh, whether it's nutrition or sleep deprivation. So you you could essentially enter with a plan of how to uh, beat both of those things. Were you able to stick to that at all? Or because you fell behind, uh, you're up against the clock so early on, did that cause problems? And you kind of had to scrap your whole plan altogether. No, so we adapted, and my, my crew was outstanding. Uh, Julian Jameson, who crewed for me last year and is a Barkley vet, and, and John Fagavaresi, uh, who's a, a previous finisher, and uh, my, my cousin Joe, uh, Joe Kelly, were, were there, and they, 
Uh, they adapted very quickly, and that's part of planning for Barkley is planning for kind of, kind of these contingencies and being able to think ahead. Uh, you know, if, if this happens, then I need to do this. Then if that happens, I need to do that. And, you know, it's, I kind of liken it to a chess match where you're trying to think six moves ahead of, of what your opponent might do. So it, it disrupted the plan, uh, but we, we were able to adapt and, and keep moving and, and get those quick transitions in to uh, ensure we didn't lose any more time. It was incredibly impressive because all day as, you know, filming Gary or, or spectating or, or sitting in camp, we kept worrying that the times weren't necessarily in line with last year's times. So we're like, oh my gosh, they're falling behind. But every time you guys came into camp, you were so laser focused and there was no doubt, like whether or not there was doubt in the mind, you never showed doubt. This is for both you and Gary, but it was a pretty amazing thing to watch, especially the break where you decided to both take quick naps, where you were so right. efficient with your time <laughs> that within you, you gave yourself 20 to 25 minutes to sleep and you both fell asleep within 10 seconds. It was like head hit the pillow and heavy snoring from two tents. It was pretty amazing. Um, let's get some live questions here because we have a ton of them. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, great question in the chat room from Maggie Gudrell, who is also what's up, Maggie? Incredible ultra runner herself, uh -huh, and guest is of the show. Currently, potentially collecting intel. Really interesting. I would like to see her. Do this. Yes, so she says. Would love to see her there. Yeah. yeah, she's a serious question. I want an honest answer. Uh, why do you think a woman has yet to finish? So I think that. Statistically, it, it's it's a lower chance, but I think that it, you know, it's it's definitely possible. Definitely something that I would love to see. Laz would love to see, and there there have been huge debates on this uh, on the the Barclay uh, listserv and on uh, many other forums. And you know, you, you do require a minimum threshold of physical capability to finish Barkley, but there are so many other factors involved. And so statistically speaking, you might have fewer women that meet that th physical threshold, but they're definitely out there and it's about getting them into the race. And kind of the realization that I had after this year is this year, my, my main limiting factor was, was mental fatigue and, and sleep deprivation. And there is absolutely no reason why a woman can't deal with that as good or better than I did. And I've gotten beat by women in ultras. So clearly there are women out there that, that meet that, mis that minimum physical threshold. So it's, it's really, to me, a, a question of getting them to the race and getting one that, that really wants it bad enough because that's that's such a key at Barkley. You, you've got to want it so bad. And when you get to that fourth and fifth loop and you, you just want to go to sleep, you, you've, you've got to keep pushing. And, and you've got to be able to have that focus to, to move back towards the gate. It's, it's an awesome conversation. And mm -hmm. it's something it's, it's talked about in camp all weekend long. Everyone's wondering... You know, is one of the females that is participating on a particular year, are they the one that's and, gonna do it? And being a woman there spectating, like you're always like secretly just like really, really hoping to see, you know, the the women just to keep going and it'll be such an incredible thing when it happens. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And and, every, and you know, there's all these rumors that like Laz makes a joke that, you know, no woman will ever finish. He I, wants a woman. Yeah, to John, you can probably even attest to this. Like Laz wants like he, oh, he, absolutely. He would love nothing more. And really, that's to me, that's part of his filtering process. He has all these filtering processes out there, including the secret of application uh, to kind of limit the applicants to the people that actually should be there and actually have a chance. And part of that is him telling people, no, you can't do it. You're going to fail. And if your reaction to that is, you know, anything but, oh, yeah, I'll show you then you're, you're probably not the kind of person who is going to succeed at Barclay. There's a comment real briefly. Run Joe Run says, when is Kim and Ethan going to join forces and do it? Yeah, no, never. No. Yeah. <laughs> I get this question often, like, well, why are you so interested in it if you're never going to do it? Or why would you never attempt it? And It's fascinating, but like, you know, what John was saying, like, you really have to want it. 
And yeah. as much as it fascinates me and I would love to see a loop or three loops, it's, I, <laughs> I don't think it's in me. Yeah. And, and you know, like in some people in the chat room are like, oh, so-and-so should go do it. And so should like this woman could go do it. And this woman could go do it. It's not in everybody's wheelhouse to, to really want something like this. And that's what makes it so special that John finished. It took John three years, but those are three years where each time he learned a lesson, but then also saw how much it takes to finish and continue yeah. to go back. That's how much John wanted it. And like, I can't even begin to, to know John, just like how much, yeah. sorry. Oh, sorry. And I was going to say, there's actually a good question in the chat room from Kimasabi 75 Great. question for John, how bad did you want it and what makes you want it? So for me, again, it was, it's, it's such a personal race for me that, you know, the, those are my mountains and that's my community. And I, I could go win Western States or hard rock or any of the huge races out there. And to be completely honest, it, it wouldn't mean as much to me. No one from the community would, would even know what those races are because again, it's, it's not a community where there's much of a running scene. So being able to get that kind of in my hometown where all of these people know and, and uh, really take pride in it uh, was was awesome. And I, I just uh, I wanted it. Um, and I'm also kind of the person type of person that once I do set my sights on something, uh, I, I will stop at nothing. I, I'm completely persistent until I either get there or I just can't move anymore. So once it was initially in my sights, it was just, uh, I had to do it. That's, that's something that uh, it's incredible. It's incredible. If you've, if you've ever seen the people that come in after one loop that took them 30 hours to right. finish, you see it in their face of just, I got to experience it. I got to try it. Never again, you know, that sort of thing. And then you see guys like John and, and Gary and other people that have finished this before. And it's a, it's a different, it's a different type of human that can, that can accomplish this sort of thing. You really, I mean, again, I've never seen more than 10 feet of this course. Right. <laughs> uh, and I can already tell you that it is just not in my wheelhouse. It's just not because I would go to, like Kim and I have talked about this and uh, we basically say, I would love to do a loop. I would love to do a loop. But I don't feel like if you can't, if you don't go into this race knowing that you can do five or at least having the confidence you can do five, that or I wanting to or do wanting five, to like do five, that, want. that you have any business there. So I would never, ever want to apply for something that would be essentially wasting a spot for someone who has worked their whole life, you know, that sort of thing. And people are talking about the Barkley Fall Classic in the chat room. Have you participated in that event? And I, I believe it's not even close to a single loop. Uh, but John, maybe you can attest to whether it is difficult or speak on that. Uh, so I have not done it personally. Some of the guys I know from the race, Scott Breeden and, and Jason Lance have done it. And mm. kind of what's been relayed to me is, is that it, it is not a loop uh, as far as the overall level of difficulty. But that is something that, that I think would be fun to, to go do one day. I just haven't found myself down there and able to do it uh, so far. So let's talk a bit about this final loop um, before we kind of wrap up the show, mm -hmm. John, because... This is now your second time that you've reached this fifth and final loop of this course. You got to choose the direction. Uh, I believe you and Gary had a conversation. Um, was there a reasoning behind your choice of a certain direction? And and kind of what was the most difficult part of this final loop? Yeah, so I, I chose clockwise, A, because I was more comfortable with that direction. And B, because I just ever since I had even kind of had this race as a as a twinkle in my eye, I had imagined finishing it and going up chimney top, this this mountain I hiked on as a kid, and it looks down over our family farm. And in the clockwise direction, that's that's where your final page is. Uh, and you know, it it happened nothing like that, but going into the last loop, I, I still had that vision in my head that that's that's how it was gonna happen. And so we, we discussed it for a little while and we didn't really have a clear resolution. And then out of nowhere, Gary says, so, you know, I'll, I'll go counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that. I mean, I, he, I think, saw some benefits to that uh, for him. But uh, it was, you know, Gary is, is an awesome guy, a uh, great character. And, you know, that was uh, 
huge, huge move uh, on his part. And so the last loop, though, I, you know, last year I, I thought I was close. Uh, I thought with that, that four loops and, and one book, I was like, yeah, I was, I was so close. And, and no, no, that, that fifth loop just is so much more difficult than any of the previous ones. The toll it takes on you and the mental battle that at least I was fighting at that point, and maybe it's because we had the early start, uh, but just staying awake and staying focused and staying on task and being able to move fast enough. I, I ended up taking two naps uh, on the course, or, or at least two, uh, two that I intended. And those each kind of briefly cleared my mind and, and allowed me to, to keep moving forward. Wow. Uh, and then at the very end, when I, I did climb that final uh, ascent to the top of Chimney Top and it was raining and it was fogged in and I couldn't see anything and it was cold and, and miserable, uh, you know, I, I thought I had it at that point. And then all of a sudden, 20 minutes just disappeared from my watch. Uh, I had an hour and 40 minutes left. And then I looked down and I was standing somewhere else and I had an hour and 20 minutes left and I have no idea what happened. And so I spent the next little bit like trying to, even though I'd been to that place so many times and it was such an easy path, all I had to do was get from the book to the trail and I, I couldn't figure it out. Nothing looked familiar. And I, I kind of wandered around there for a little while before finally seeing a, a blaze on the tree for the trail. And I, I ran over to it, triple checked my bearing just to make sure that I turned the right direction because, it, it, you know, I knew that I turned left. But at that point, who knew what was going on? So I, I double checked it and started down that trail. And just the entire time uh, in my mind, all I could think was was touch the gate. You just have to touch the gate. I had to keep reminding myself, this is Barkley. You have all your pages. You just have to touch the gate and stay awake. And I, I was so worried that I, I was going to be that guy that, that got all my pages and then I fell asleep or I forgot why I was out there and just wandered off. Um, and, and finally getting there and, and finally touching, it was just such such a relief after <laughs> fighting that mental battle for, for close to the past 13 hours. Do you remember that moment? Do you remember touching the gate? Because that's, that was my worry watching you come in. I was like, he's, you can see your emotion, right? That you could see the emotion, but a part of me is like, his brain is, is about ready to check out. And mm -hmm. it's like, your brain's going to shut down and go to sleep. Right. Do you remember that moment? Are you able to kind of live in that for a bit? I, I do. Uh, I, I vaguely remember it and I uh, kind of, remember the experience at least. And, and that's another thing, you know, you asked earlier about kind of the exposure and the documentation of the race. And that's another thing that'll be cool for me is, you know, I'll be able to go back and uh, look at the, the pictures, the, the tweets, Jamil Curry made an awesome video of the finish. Uh, I'll be able to go back and, and look at those and, and kind of relive that experience uh, many years from now when I'm in a clear state of mind. I'll be able to see that with my kids, and uh, that, that's an awesome thing for me. You'll also uh, you'll be in my movie as well, mm -hmm. um, which uh, it's hard to watch the footage because it, it's so easy to get so emotional. Um, people are bringing this up in the chat room, and I wanted to make sure I, I asked it as well, but... This is also a testament to John and his character. Uh, mm -hmm. This also our dog is snoring. So if you hear snoring, it's our dog. It's not Kim so or, or myself. Has um, nothing to do with the conversation. Has nothing to do with the conversation. <laughs> he's had a he's had a nice long walk today. Uh, the first thing that came out of your mouth after you touched the gate was "Where's Gary?" Which I think is it's incredible that you two worked. You know, for the first four laps, you separated. I believe you saw each other about halfway through the lap. I don't you know whether you high fived or hugged or napped I, or spooned. I, who knows? Uh, but when you came and you touched the yellow gate for the, for the first time in your life, your first question was where it's Gary. Um, was there a reason for that or, or, you know, did you worry that he wasn't going to make it? Did you think that he had already and, finished or? And did you guys actually see each other on the fifth? Yeah. Moon? Did you guys actually see each other? So we, we missed. So yes. we, That's we right. passed each other on kind of the lower portion of Stallion Mountain, which is 
one of those places where there's uh, there's some dense mountain laurel and it's easy, you know, you could be 20 feet away and, and not see each other. Uh, so, and there, you know, your line can slightly vary on, on that section of the course. So we did mm-hmm. miss each other there. But when, when I found out that that is about where we had passed, that's, that's roughly the, the halfway point. Uh, so I did, uh, when I came in and, and I touched it, I, I fully expected him to, to be coming down at, at any point. Uh, mm-hmm. And I did want to know, you know, would it, well, well, did he finish? Are we still waiting for him? I, you know, surely he will be here soon. And, and, you know, in my, in my state of delirium, I, I guess really, I, I don't know what I was expecting because I know that no one has seen him. That's the nature of the Barkley. No one's seen him since they saw him at the fire tower. Uh, so I guess I kind of understood what everyone on Twitter is feeling when I, I'm sitting there <laughs> saying, well, well, where is he? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I fully expected to see him come down. He he had kind of the difficult part of his loop over early in, in the night. And I, I, I thought he was moving well. And, and I, I thought that he would be able to go down, get down and, and we'd have that uh, moment uh, kind of together. But it's uh, obviously what did happen is, is quite heartbreaking. And, and I, I can't imagine uh, going through that at this point, but it's, it's incredibly impressive what he did. And I'm proud to have spent that time out there with him. We, uh, we're obviously in touch with Gary and we'll, we'll either get him on the show or, or uh, do something with him soon. Um, he had a race this weekend that he, <laughs> he was race directing. He was race directing this weekend. So he came straight off of Barkley right into race directing. So he's had a very busy weekend, but we will have him on to talk to him about his experience and stuff like that. But man, John, like, it is an incredible thing to finish this event, obviously, uh, as someone who's only been there twice just to witness it and and, and seen you both times. Uh, it was an incredibly emotional thing to see you come and touch that gate for the first time, your family and, and a local boy, right? Tennessee. Uh, I believe you are the first Tennessean to actually complete this. Is that correct? I, I believe so, yeah. Which is awesome. Uh, do people around town recognize you? I mean, are they holding you up on their shoulders and like, did you have a parade or I mean, any of that kind of stuff? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't. I've, uh, I've gotten some interviews with local papers, but you know, I, I, I kind of hid in the house for a couple of days, unable to move. And then we, we bolted town shortly after that. So uh, it, it is cool to kind of see the, the local support reach out to me on, on Facebook and, and whatnot. Uh, and it's, uh, again, just just awesome to see for a, a community without much of a running scene to now have so much uh, pride in, in this event. It's awesome, man. It's just it's so cool to see a finisher uh, and especially have it be have it be you, man. It's yeah, just, after we got to see you last year. Yeah, it was really it was really cool to see. Super you touching. Finish. So obviously you probably answered this question a thousand times. People are asking in the chat room. Is it has John ever done karaoke at Angie's? <laughs> that's that not the question? question, but that that's a great question. I'll, I'll save mine. Have you ever done karaoke at Angie's, the diner in town? <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. So that, that's actually a newer place. It's opened in the past few years. So I haven't had a, a chance to spend much time there. But the uh, the the biscuits are, are pretty incredible. We've talked about them multiple times on this show. <laughs> yeah, those biscuits should have their own Instagram account. Uh, they, they are that good. The question is if you would ever go back to do this again. Uh, I don't want to, you know, I'll never say never. And maybe in uh, a future year, next year, I, I highly doubt it. I, I'd like to kind of have the time off, spend uh, that time with with my family and go out there and kind of enjoy uh, being a part of the other side of the race, being in camp, maybe helping someone else uh, get their goal at Barkley. As I've, I've never been in camp. The I've, I've been one of the last people in every, every year I've done it. And by the time every, you know, everyone gets in, people just bolt. It's, it's kind of up and out of there pretty quickly. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And, and maybe in, in some future year, I, I could see myself returning, but, but right now I'm going to, going to take the break and, and kind of recharge a bit. I mean, well-deserved man. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I would never be able to assume the amount of work and sacrifice that goes into training for an event like this, let alone the actual event itself. Especially with the family involved as well. Yeah. Uh, new, ki- new children and, and wife and extended family. 59 hours and 30-ish minutes. Uh, John Kelly managed to get this thing done, which is it's bonkers because it was harder than it was last year and which was harder than the year before that so it's not like john is doing the same race three times in a row and finally gets it done he's doing a more difficult race each year and accomplishing more each time that's just a testament to the amount of willpower strength desire uh head strength it's amazing man absolutely incredible there's a comment in the chat room from uh nathan says john embodies ultra running at its finest couldn't agree more couldn't agree more man so huge congratulations to you dude Thank you. Thank you very much. You got it. And uh, before we move into the post show, I want to remind everyone watching live, we're going to do a a little quickie question quiz here with John before we wrap up this main show, Mm -hmm. because it is something we do with all of our new new guests. Uh, But if you would like to join us in the post show, which is a 15, 20 minute long extended show where we get to rapid fire through all the questions that didn't get asked during the main show, please consider joining Patreon, patreon.com slash the ginger runner for as little as a buck a month. You basically get access to all the post shows and some additional stuff. Uh, The new head wraps are now available to Patreon supporters. They will be available to the public here next week. So you won't want to miss that. But if you are uh, wanting to support the show, keep the lights on and the mics hot and stuff like that, that's basically it. It's a publicly funded channel, essentially. Uh, It's much like PBS, but with uh, less Bob Ross. We should should bring Bob Ross on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll make that happen. Uh, So consider that. Patreon.com slash The Ginger Runner. And we'll see you guys in the post show. The link is already up right there, right now, for tonight's post show. There's already people in there. There's already people in there (laughs) getting ready. uh, Because we do have lots of questions that we did not ask during the main show. And we only have John for a little bit of time. We're actually a little bit over. So I want to make sure that we get to that. But before we move on to the post show, John, we have a little thing here on the show called Quickie Question Quiz for all first-time guests. It's, It's a very simple short list of very uh basic questions that you just answer as quickly as you can so give me the thumbs up when you're ready and we'll just rip through let's do it cool what was your very first race uh kindergarten turkey trot which was awesome (laughs) i I won my kindergarten turkey trot and it was not until uh about two months before barkley when i did the wild oak trail 100 mile race that i won another race outright that's awesome. <laughs> Favorite running movie? Ooh, that's that's a tough one. Um, might have to go with Chariots of Fire there. That that theme song. Classic. Man, that, that'll <laughs> yeah. get you going. Classic. Uh, favorite place to run currently? I know you don't live in Tennessee currently, right? What's your favorite place to run? Right. Uh, so, I mean, favorite place that I can run? Currently, I, you know, I've got the Rock Tree Creek Trail system in uh, D.C., which it's incredibly fortunate. You know, I'm in an urban area and I can basically run 16 miles to work and 14 is on bike path or actual trail. So wow. that's that's incredible for me. That's awesome. Uh, guilty pleasure TV show. Maybe a lot of the time on uh, the treadmill helped you pick one. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty big uh, sci fi geek. So pretty much uh, anything in that genre, I, I'm a. A huge Stargate fan, uh, you know. Um, unfortunately, there's there's a you know nice shout out to you, you Vancouver folks, um, but it's it hasn't had anything new in a while, so I'm still waiting. Uh, that that was MacGyver's like comeback show, right? Like uh, in the '90s, yeah, 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 early 2000s. Why are you looking at I me like know. that? Kim's looking at me strange. I'm also a sci-fi geek, uh, Kim. <laughs> makes fun of me for it uh okay that's not true <laughs> favorite pre-race meal and in this one i'm going to kind of change it what was your pre-race meal for the barkley so it, it's it's kind of the same thing uh for for each one i i go with an apple butter bagel and it's uh for barkley i had my my aunt mary ann's homemade bagels and i i had this giant jar of apple butter that i got for winning that that wild oak trail 100 that was my prize um, so I, I busted that out for Barkley, and uh, that was my before race meal and my between loop meal. Nice. I'm excited about this one because I think I know the answer. What was your favorite post race indulgence? And in this case, what was the first thing you indulged on after the Barkley? So the first thing uh, was was pizza and a Butterfinger Blast from Sonic. You know, growing up, the, the two <laughs> things we had in town were Partners Pizza and Sonic. Well, and there was Hardee's too. Um, but yeah, I, I love me a Butterfinger Blast, and then 
a, a few days later, uh, after my stomach has kind of refortified itself a little bit, I, I go for the crispy bow, which is uh, my, my creation of, of two crispy cream donuts with a, a Cajun play patty from Bojangles in the middle. It sounds so awesome. It's, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned you only doing it twice a year, and I can understand why, but it sounds awesome. It, it sets you up for a great day. <laughs> and the final question, uh, what are your current running kicks? Uh, so I've, I've actually, on roads, I've been running in the same thing since like freshman year of high school, the ASICS GT series. Uh, but for, for trails, uh, I've, I've moved over to Las Portivas for the... <laughs> Barkley, uh, I used Mutants on the first four loops and then had a, a pair of Akasha for the last loop. Awesome. I was going to say, I thought I saw Los, Los Portivas on the feet. Uh, well, again, John Kelly, congratulations, man, on completing the Barkley. You're one of, I guess, 14 other people. You are the 15th finisher of the event, uh, which is like, that's how crazy this is. Over a thousand so people have, have like <laughs> attempted it and only 15 now have completed it. It's insane. For those who are watching live, John, where can they find you on social media? Because there will probably be questions that don't get asked. Uh, where can people find you and reach out and stuff like that? Uh, so I've got a blog at randomforestrunner.com. And from that, uh, there are links to my Twitter and, and Facebook and, and Instagram. And, and even my LinkedIn, if you want some data science work done. <laughs> <laughs> It's awesome. Yeah. Hit him up on LinkedIn, guys. Let's get this guy a job. He, he, I'm sure he has a great job. But if you don't, we'll make it happen on, on Ginger Winter Live. Uh, so that's it for tonight's show, guys. If you want to join us again, um, we're going to do the post show here with John. It's going to be a brief one because I don't want to keep him too long because it's East Coast time. So it's much later there than it is here. Nice. But uh, again, go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner and you can subscribe. It's a monthly thing. You can end whenever you want, uh, but it's a buck minimum a month and it's a pretty good deal. You get some pretty cool stuff on the back end there. Uh, we're going to do lots of these questions here with John in just a couple of seconds. So join us in the post show if you'd like to. If not, we'll see you next week because new videos twice a week and uh, yeah, lots of lots of great stuff coming up, including the documentary about Gary Robbins' attempt at mm -hmm. the Barclay Marathons, which features some incredible footage of John himself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's it, everyone. Get out there. Train hard, race harder, party hardest. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Ginger Runner.